Welcome to the Workbench and welcome to another episode of Wheels Wings TV. Today we have the long awaited 172nd scale Avro Vulcan from Airfix. Let's have a look. First up, we have the upper wing surfaces, molded left and right, split along the center line. Nicely engraved panel lines throughout. Credit to Airfix, they are not wide trenches, not too big, not too shallow just about right. Some here are a little bit heavier than others, but I'm assuming those are more pronounced on the real thing anyway. We do have some raised detail here. I believe these were vortex generators to direct airflow over the wing. We do have a noticeable sink mark running along the flap lines on both sides, which does correspond to this large structure here. And that's not, mm, that's probably just pronounced enough that you're gonna have to fill, fill that in and sand it flush. I think even with a super matte coat, that's you're gonna catch the light on that. Everything um, maybe maybe a little bit around the rear here, but not not too bad. It's kind of hard to tell, but definitely along the flap lines. Fortunately, that seems to be the only place of any real consequence, anyway. Not too bad. Followed up with our lower wings. A bit more going on in terms of rivet detail, which is something definitely absent on the top of the wing. Big expanses are definitely gain from a little bit of riveting anyway, but more nice engraved panel lines, not too heavy, not too wide. I think they're kind of Goldilocks just right, which is good. Got that same sort of sink mark just ahead of the flap hinge. Is the same as on the top. I'll have to level that off a little bit. A little bit of a little bit of one here as well. Now, more fastidious among you will definitely go over this with a fine tooth comb, leveling out everything. Being on the bottom, this is less important. So take you can take the effort and Put it on more visible areas if you so choose. I know that's generally how I like to work. But so far, pretty good. Next, we have our blue steel missile. Somebody should maybe call Zoolander to make sure there's no copyright issues there. This, of course, was a standoff nuclear weapon. Instead of dropping the bomb right over the target, fire off a big missile from a distance, and you don't have as much of a shockwave to outrun. So depending on which variant you want to do, you may or may not be using these parts. You may be using conventional bomb bay. Now, something of curiosity here is you can see some color eight color marbling 
going on in the plastic which I assume means there was either some dirt or other contaminant in the molten plastic or whatever the components are that make up that liquid styrene didn't completely come together. This is something you see a lot on short run kits where they're using very low pressure injection molding and probably not the best quality styrene. I mean, sometimes you'll see little swirls where the plastic is kind of flowed in, but everything's still the same color. Seeing different colors, that's, mm, it's a little, I mean, it doesn't seem to have affected plastic at all, but that's still worrisome to see. It kind of makes me feel like maybe their quality control is slipping a little bit. But, on a positive note, we have more nice panel lines. More or less, they do get a little bit soft around the edge, but not too bad. With this weapon in the Bombay, you're only really going to see one half of it anyway, so no big deal there. And a few other bits and pieces, and I believe an alternate tail cone for the Blue Steel equipped bomber. Next we have our vertical tail and what look to be some of our control surfaces. More nice, just right panel lines. No riveting, but it's not a huge loss. Not a huge amount of detail. I would assume that you can pose the flaps neutral or deflected if you so choose, but we will find out we can consult the instructions. Looks like don't see the don't seem to have a lot of the characteristic big heavy mold lines like some airfix kits on these small parts seems pretty fine, so obviously they got the the mating surface between the two molds nice and tight, which one would expect, seeing how this is brand new. Next one, big honking sprue. And to put that in perspective, this whole cutting mat is 18 by 24 inches, or about 53 by 35 centimeters, so big big sprue why they wouldn't break it down into smaller bits i don't know but i guess they have their reasoning we've got our turbine faces for the olympus engines we've got some various bulkheads swing spar or big hefty wing spar here or a vulcan in profile looking at it from the rear. We've got another bomb bay insert. Because there's the one for I assume that's yeah you know, that'd be the bomb bay in okay I'm I'm not quite sure what exactly that one's for, or is it that for the blue steel? Well, maybe that is, I guess. Okay, I guess that is the Bombay insert for the blue steel missile, which makes this an insert for, I don't know, potentially the tanker variant, because I do know they did convert some victors to tankers, and that does look a bit like Drogue. Okay, so we might see a victor, I think it was what, K2 variant. So we might see a boxing of that at some point. That'd be interesting. I believe those were used in... I'm not even going to hazard guess. I'm not quite sure. I do know they did a tanker variant. I will leave it at that. So we got our blue steel insert and we have what is most likely 
a tanker configuration as well. Why this would be molded separately with the blue steel is... I have no idea. Maybe I'm wrong. We'll find out. Some reasonable attempts at detail on some of the bulkheads and surfaces. We get some curious blue stuff on the parts here. I'm just it just brushes off so it's not in the plastic, but I don't know what that is. Maybe somebody had a birthday party when they were packing this. And injector pins where we don't see them. Thank you. First we got our engine intakes separated into upper and lower halves. Hopefully the seams there aren't going to be too ugly. But just judging from all the structural components, this should be a very strong model, which is good. Next, we've got our nose section. That's been kind of <laughs> crushed because it's, well, I'll give them one thing. The sprues failed on the sprue and not on the model, so hopefully we don't have any damage there. Anyway. Got more, that's cockpit, lower nose with the entry hatch, different nose cones with a refueling probe or without refueling probe, depending on what you're doing. Got some seat cushions with some really chunky molded in belts. Not that you're gonna see really anything in the cockpit anyway. Air ejection seats by the looks of it, some control yokes. We've got our conventional Bombay doors, along with a whole bunch of standard high explosive ordnance. So you do get a uh, thousand pounders if you wanted to do one of the Black Buck aircraft, although you would still need to do a few other modifications. Of course that is believe that's, do we cut that if we're doing, or is that just, I think that's just the closed insert, and we've got separate doors here. So I guess you can use that maybe possibly as a sacrificial mask, save yourself some masking tape. Still not too bad. Let me just say it's probably a good thing that they put these keep plastic bags away from babies because you could probably stuff an entire teenager, let alone a small child, in some of these sprue bags. Our last sprue of gray parts. We've got our good. <clears throat> Somebody just barely holding on there. I'm gonna hope that there was <laughs> nothing supposed to be there. We've got our main wheels, which look pretty good. Not the world's best, but pretty good for out of the box. Now we, you, Armory Models does have a very nice set of resin wheels with the brake calipers on the back side, so those would probably be a nice addition if you wanted to. Our main we English main landing gear legs, and various other components. Got our boarding ladder, hatch, nose wheels, nose wheel strut. Got our tail cone. We've got our exhaust. And 
And these are all numbered, I'm guessing port and starboard. With more of our engine blade faces. Once again, we get things in upper and lower half, so hopefully we don't have a lot of seam lines to deal with. And here we've got, I believe those are our FOD covers for the intake, so if you really don't want to have to deal with seams or whatever, you can just paint these red and stuff them in there. And looks like we got some of our air brakes and various little sticky outy brakey bits. And a few nubbins. And last but not least, our clear parts. We have I think we might be missing something here. Part number three, potentially. I guess we will see. Some small windows with some very obvious distortions in them. Unfortunately, those are probably not looking into anywhere, so that's probably not too bad. Some pretty obvious distortions in the main part here, but that's going to be painted, so that's no real concern. Windshield. Those are all flat panels. That's, that's acceptable, I guess. I mean, the cockpit is black, so you're not really going to see much anyway, but you'll be able to see a little bit why they didn't decide to just frost this rear section or texture it. I don't know, but... Eh. Typical, airfix, clear, acceptable. And of course, our instructions. A little history blurb on the Vulcan, some basic specs. Obviously, the Newark Air Museum was where they went for their reference material. Assembly, icons, don't chew on the parts, etc. Okay, step one. Obviously, I'm assuming that's our cockpit with probably the nose wheel bay going into place. Looks like sensors, console, rudder pedals, front bulkhead, instrument panel with the controls and decal for the gauges. That goes in. Projection seat halves by two with our cushions and our molded in belts, which are probably gonna be more than adequate for this thing. I wouldn't go dumping an entire photo etch set into the cockpit because you're not gonna see it. Seats go in. Side consoles go in. You know, some of those are oxygen bottles. They go in. Upper portion of the boarding ladder goes in. Our rear seats go in. Times two. And then the third seat. They all go in place. Rear bulkhead goes into place. No appreciable attempt at detail for the flight engineer and the navigator and the bomb aimer's position, but you're not seeing you're not really gonna see the pilot's position. You're definitely not gonna see that. So no huge loss there. Uh, we got our kind of our nose weight container. They're calling for 40 grams at least. Plug that in there, stick that on the front, which is nice, so you can kind of stuff that thing full of your weight and not have to worry about damaging your outer nose. I've heard of some people using the wrong adhesive and things getting melty and hot and not good. 
Trap the cockpit into the left and right halves of the nose with a few clear parts. Uh, note for closed door, fit G12. For open door, C steps 137 to 139. Okay, so if you're having this hatch closed, you gotta grind off a little bit of the hinge point and just glue that in place. Along with a clear, I believe that's for the, I'm not sure if that's for the bomb site or the, um, camera perhaps and pick your nose cone dependent on your variant so option a you're going to need the one with the refueling probe option b is the standard plain nose option a for the scheme a scheme cut and file away the area shown in green from parts d3 and d19 so that's going to be for our blue steel missile so cut this away and then we've got, okay, we've got all of our various structural supports for the roof of the bomb bay, along with our wing spar sections, all going together. That looks like it's going to be plenty strong. More wing spar sections with outer supports, so nice big box structure to keep the wing together. So hopefully, so we shouldn't have... A lot of flexing, hopefully nothing droops over time. Once again, for your scheme A with the blue steel, cut away green areas. Inversely, if you're doing scheme B, leave them alone, obviously. A few holes to drill out. Uh, if you're doing in-flight, you've got closed wheel well doors, which must go in assuming from the inside and repeat blue steel remove these portions uh, only B scheme should be built with bomb bay doors open to build this option skip 33 34 and go to 35 and 36 uh, for A scheme, assemble lower wings to D12 as shown. Okay, so I want you to put these, basically make one big lower section before you attach to the upper section. And yes, we're using that long skinny one. So I am correct, that one is for the blue steel and the other one is for a potential tanker variant. Once again, for our B scheme with the doors closed, assemble the lower wing as shown, then go to 34. Now we've got our kind of center structural section going into the lower wing. I'm not sure why they're shown for. Oh, that goes in. Uh, okay, yeah, I get get confused already. Yeah, so if we're doing Bombay doors open, just ignore all this. Go right to 35, which is putting each wing half onto that center structure. Uh, there's your closed nose wheel doors if you're doing wheels up. There's your nose wheel bay, I assume. Yep, nose wheel bay. And you've got your port and starboard main landing gear bays built up with a box structure and go in. Note for A scheme before assembling parts in 46 and 47. Cut out and use paper templates below to mark the front edge of the white painted area inside engine intakes. Okay, so basically everything behind this line is white, everything in front of that line 
I assume is going to be camouflaged. I'm going to assume that Edward or somebody else is probably going to come up with a pre-cut set of masks for this rather than relying on paper. So we'll, we have to wait and see there. So mask off everything, then assemble. Upper and lower halves together. And if you want to fit the FOD covers, they're saying do it now. And then intakes drop into the lower wing, port and starboard. Two clear parts go into the wing, port and starboard. We can now bring together our two upper wing halves. It looks like we have some nice big tabs that cross that seam, so hopefully that should be plenty strong enough. And of course, it'll definitely hold together once you put everything together. And then take the lower wing, make that to the upper wing, stick the nose on. Like any big lifting body design, you've got a horizontal seam here and a vertical seam here. So if you're going to have any fit issues, they're probably going to be at this joint. So make sure you test fit this thing like crazy so you're not getting nasty surprises. A couple of pieces to plug into the intakes. So it'll be interesting to see how well all of these seams are going to fit together. Otherwise, you're going to have some adventures in skinny stick sanding getting in these intakes. Nose cone, which needs some holes drilled for option B. That goes in place. Then we've got our exhausts. Uh, part E1 must only be used as a temporary jig to accurately align parts E8, 9, 10, 11. Take care not to glue E1 to any other parts. Okay, so a jig to align the exhaust nozzles. That's great. My question also would be why wouldn't you engineer the fit of these parts to be positive so that you do not have any potential misalignment? That's the other way to do it. Don't see any jigs in Tamiya kits. Cough, cough. So put all in, of course these are all multiple pieces. So hopefully those joints all go together well. Because these are of course gonna be metal, so any seams are gonna be way more noticeable. I mean, not that there's a lot of them sticking out, but uh, wouldn't be surprised if we see somebody come out with uh, resin replacements for something like that. But we'll have to wait and see. Uh, same thing for the opposite side, wash, rinse, and repeat. Various air scoops for the bottom. which oh I'm like why are they showing me the same thing it's just port and starboard engines scoops we um, we've got these little I guess these are some sort of fairing for the engine with some plumbing piping running underneath I guess can I 
makes you wonder why they wouldn't just well I guess I guess because there's an undercut otherwise they probably could have just molded that in place but I guess I guess you can see up the rear end of it there so okay and we've got our vertical tail going together the left and right with the tip Got left and right halves of the rudder going together that can plop down depending on how good that joint is you may want to leave that off for painting of course if you want to have some controls deflected you got a maximum of 30 degrees left port or starboard got all of our flaps going together and of course we have trailing edge molded to one half which makes it a little bit sharper than if it's split between both once again i guess those flaps or flapperons i'm gonna assume flaps well all of these control surfaces can deflect positive or negative so i'm going to assume they are all flapperons by the use of a flap and an aileron. So maximum of 10 up, 22 degrees down, or 12 and a half and 27 for the outer control surfaces with their little fairings. Now, chances are if you do have these deflected to any degree, you're going to either have to add some material or remove some from these fairings because they would, in theory, tuck up into each other as the control moved. Kind of like how the rear of the engine nacelles and the Lancaster sort of tuck up when the flaps drop. And we've got one of our speed brakes. I was, nope, um, I'm mistaken. Um, landing gear door. Got our landing, got our wheels going together. Lots of wheels to paint because, of course, we've got four pairs of wheels on each bogey. And all this goes together. Those look like nice beefy landing gear, so they should be plenty strong. This is going to be a big heavy model. And it looks like this is something you could definitely leave out until the very end. No problem there. Goes in. Um, I have heard there is some component in here that you only see on parked museum aircraft for extra strength in that capacity. I believe it's these here, just to keep the this part from rotating, but leave that out if you will. But hey, having a little extra strength in this case is not necessarily a bad thing. Wash, rinse, and repeat for the opposite side. Got the inner doors with their actuators, both sides. Nose wheel strut, another big beefy component with all of its component structure. Wheels go on. That locks in to the nose wheel bay, door with its actuator, other door with its actuator. And on to the ordnance. 7 times 3, 21 1,000 pound bombs, which would be an accurate loadout for the early Black Buck raids on the Falkland Islands. We've got, I assume, yep, our open bomb bay doors, left and right. Um, I assume that I assume that these probably kind of rotate in and down so there's not as much door hanging out as well because just that little bit sticking out wouldn't close the entire gap. Interesting. Uh, we've got our options for our speed brakes, open or closed. We've got our blue steel missile. Upper and lower halves, forward fins, more fins, rear end. Okay, that's so that's the rear end of the missile. 
its fins going in place and you can plop that big thing in there. And some more little clear bits, some humps bumps. We've got our boarding ladder with our crew access door and the railings and everything. That's going in place. So you can have that open. That is at 45 degrees to the vertical, although having it engineered so it positively locates would have been a better option than having us have to do math. More of our little delicate break off bits, which look as though they have nice deep attachment points, so that's nice. We have our upper wing speed brakes, closed or open. Hopefully these parts fit well, otherwise you're going to have some filling and rescribing to do. A few more antennas, and of course you're doing option A, we've got the refueling probe. And you have a finished Aero Vulcan. Color scheme A, Scampton Wing, Royal Air Force Scampton, Lincolnshire, 1966. This aircraft currently preserved at the Newark Air Museum. Typical, we got the cam ocean gray, or sorry, sea gray and dark green on top, white on the bottom. And this is our blue steel carrying aircraft, so we got that as well. Typical Humbrol callouts, convert those into whatever your favorite brand is. Uh, with a switch to low level roll in the mid 60s, Vulcans were repainted in glossy camouflage finish of medium sea gray. Medium sea gray and dark green with white undersides. A single 84 inch roundel was carried on the upper port wing only. Gloss paint wore down to a more satin sheen, and in some instances the randall started to fade. Okay, so these things should not be dead flat, they should have a little bit of a shine to them. And option B, 12 Squadron Cunnings B, 1963, so three years earlier, in the overall nuclear anti-flash white scheme. And this will be our conventionally armed aircraft. Although I would assume there'll be a plethora of British freefall nuclear weapons become available in 72nd scale for this. And because it's a relatively modern jet, we have a plethora of stencils to put all over the thing. I'm assuming that there's some difference between A and B, probably just in terms of color. Probably going to be lighter colors on the dark camo, darker stencils on the lighter camo. So, for those of you that have to put every decal on, there you go. And finally, the decals themselves. Typical airfix, doesn't say on the sheet, but these are always printed by cartograph. Good color, good registration, relatively thin. Yeah, some of these lines, I would, I always recommend masking and painting those because that's easier to deal with than trying to deal with these skinny little decals. Of course, have the, the uh, low-vis, anti-flash, pastel-colored roundels, which are very unique to the British aircraft. Even have some really nice gold in the squadron crests there. That's a nice little touch. Of course, we have the rings for around all of our bombs. Shouldn't have any issue. Instrument panels, consoles, various other bits. I, I assume most of these are going to be for some sort of antennas, receivers, 
transmitters, electronic wizardry of some description, so you might be just as easy to paint these on as use decals. But should be drama free. So the new 172nd scale Vulcan from Airfix. Definitely an improvement on some of their other recent releases. I'd say it looks like they gave this one a bit more effort, which is good to see. Um, not without some sink marks and some questionable engineering here and there. Well, you can't have everything, I suppose. But, hey, can't complain too much because it certainly beats the heck out of trying to build the original Airfix Vulcan, which many have tried, many have failed, and few have succeeded. So, if you are interested at all in the Cold War nuclear deterrence or the conflict in the South Atlantic in the early 1980s or in James Bond, this is definitely going to be a subject that will perk your interest. These are, of course, available over on the Wheels Wings eStore. You can head over there and pick one up. If you'd like to see more content like this, make sure to subscribe and hit that like button. Thank you very much, and we'll catch you next time.